So, I am the director of audiology here in town at physical therapy and balance centers at our two locations. So I want to start by telling you a little bit about me. I did my undergraduate work over at Ohio State University. I have my doctorate in audiology from Washington University in St. Louis School of Medicine. And dizziness is one of my specialty areas, so that's what we're going to chat a little bit about today. So we have a couple learning objectives. The first is to be able to identify different types of dizziness. So dizziness is a huge catch-all term for a lot of different things. And we're going to go into that in a little more detail. Because of that, it can be really difficult to diagnose, and we'll go over that as well. I want you to understand vestibular, which is the inner ear balance organ, how it functions and what is happening when it's dysfunctioning, and also be able to identify different modes of treatment for dizziness. So we're going to start with just a few facts about dizziness. So experts believe that more than four out of 10 Americans, sometimes in their lives, will experience an episode of dizziness significant enough to send them to the doctor. And about 15% of American adults had a balance and dizziness problem during this past year. So that's a good amount of people that are experiencing this on a yearly basis. As many as 35% of adults in the United States have experienced some form of vestibular inner ear balance organ dysfunction. And in a 2011 survey by the Vestibular Disorders Association, they stated that on average, patients contact between four and five different uh, medical professionals before they receive a diagnosis. That's a lot of doctor's appointments just to get some answers. So the economic and the social impacts of dizziness are really underestimated. So with that, if you have a broken arm, everyone can tell that you have a broken arm. They're gonna accommodate your broken arm. No one can see that you're dizzy. So that comes into play in the work environment, um, social environments, and we'll talk about some of those implications too. All right, so a little participation, if you will. What I'd like to do is figure out exactly how common dizziness is. So what I want you to do is raise your hand as I go through these different points. So raise your hand if you have ever experienced dizziness when laying down. Raise your hand if you're prone to or you've had motion sickness when you're riding in the car, amusement rides, things like that. How about busy environments like shopping malls or casinos have made you feel kind of dizzy or uneasy and off balance? Have you ever felt like you were drunk without drinking? <laughs> well, that's true. No fun in all of the repercussions, right? <laughs> So any quick head or body movements have made you feel dizzy or nauseated? You felt symptoms of lightheadedness, spinning sensations, rocking, swaying, or imbalance throughout your life. You have felt lightheaded when standing up too quickly. Looking at you over there. We just experienced that a couple minutes ago. And you felt unsteady when walking or you tend to feel off balance when you're moving. All right, if you've raised your hand, raise your hand one more time again for me. All right, take a peek around. So you can see most people are affected by dizziness at some point or another. So, common story, we all have one. This one is mine. I'm gonna share it with you so that you get a better idea of why I do what I do. This is a picture of me actually at work after hours doing my physical therapy for my inner ear related issues. And we're gonna talk about physical therapy towards the end here. So my balance problem started when I was very young. I was about 12 when I had an infection of the inner ear that created a big problem for me. I grew up in a smaller town. Nobody really knew what was happening with me at that point. They diagnosed me with anxiety, depression, all of these different things without knowing the cause of it. So I spent a good year where sitting in the cafeteria made me feel really nervous, or um, it was the same year that we got one of those new movie theaters with the stadium seating and I couldn't even go. So it had some pretty broad implications on my life. So all of you who have felt dizzy, I know exactly how you feel. And that's part of the reason why I do what I do. So we're gonna talk about dizziness because it is a huge catch-all term. So dizziness can be a sensation of lightheadedness, faintness, unsteadiness. Disequilibrium also falls under the same category. So unsteadiness, imbalance, um, loss of equilibrium or disorientation. Vertigo is the actual perception of movement. It feels like the room is spinning, or you feel like you're spinning and the room is staying still. And then spatial disorientation of not knowing where you are in relation to the things around you. 
And then my favorite one, and this one is all mine, is I can't really describe it. And that's usually what most people come in and tell me when I say, describe your dizziness without using the word dizzy. Really hard to do. So all of these different things kind of fall into that dizziness category. So common causes of dizziness, and when you see these giant slides with all these lists, it's just to give you an idea of how big and encompassing all of this is. So it can be viral or bacterial infections, blood pressure changes, vascular problems, visual disorders, concussions or head injuries, migraines, medications, autoimmune disorders, um, fistulas, which is kind of like a, um, in the inner ear you can get a, like a leak in the membrane or a bone thinning of the inner ear, um, Meniere's disease, which is inner ear related, there can be tumors, um, mal de debarkment syndrome, which we'll talk about, and then cervical trauma or arthritis. And this is not an exhaustive list, this is just to give you an idea. So this came from my patient a couple of weeks ago. Um, good timing as I was putting all of this together that she happened to say it. So she sat down in my chair, she's half in tears, and says, I am so frustrated. I've had this issue for years and it's not getting any better. I've been everywhere. I've seen my primary care doctor, I've seen the neurologist, I've seen the ear, nose, and throat doctor, and now they're sending me to cardiology. Why can't anyone figure out what's wrong with me? Well, part of that is, is that so many different things can cause dizziness. <clears throat> One of those things is dizziness from medications. Does anyone have a bottle, a pill bottle on them? No medications, okay. So what's one of the most common side effects? May cause dizziness, right? Half of your medications at home probably say it. So antidepressants, anti-seizure drugs, blood pressure medications, anything that depresses the central nervous system, so sedatives, sleeping pills, all of those have dizziness as a side effect. So along with the fact that medications themselves might cause some dizziness is the fact that the more medications you're taking, the more risk you have of everything interacting together. So it's something we call polypharmacy. The more medications you're taking, the greater risk of a pharmacological interaction. So over one third of older adults in the US routinely use more than five medications or supplements. I don't know about you guys, but I myself use five medications or supplements. And all of those, we're not sure of all of the effects that they can have together. You can have dizziness related to cardiac or blood deficits. So one big one is blood pressure. Um, it's called orthostatic hypotension. And what it is is when your systolic blood pressure drops suddenly. If it's happening after a quick position change, such as standing up out of the chair, it may be something called postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, or POTS for short. There are some tests that can look for that. Um, but it's just that change in blood pressure. Once blood pressure comes back to normal, you start to feel okay again. And it usually results in a feeling of lightheadedness. For some people, it can cause them to faint and things like that. So fainting is usually more of a cardiac problem. We can have issues with circulation caused by a heart attack, stroke, arrhythmia, um, different things like that where we're getting inadequate blood flow to the brain into the central balance center, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and then also the inner ear vestibular organ. Um, anemia, lack of blood flow or lack of iron in the blood flow. You can also get dizziness from hypoglycemia because of low blood sugar, can affect some cognitive function. And then dehydration will also cause your blood pressure to drop. All of these different things can be causes of dizziness. Dizziness can also be related to brain or behavioral health. So neurologic conditions, MS, Parkinson's, a lot of people with these issues have a progressive loss of balance, and a lot of times some dizziness will go along with that as well. Anxiety is a big one. Um, if anyone like me doesn't like public speaking, you can imagine I'm feeling a little bit lightheaded in front of you up here today. So panic causes you to hyperventilate, causing kind of wooziness symptoms with that. Something called persistent postural perceptual dizziness. We're gonna talk about that in more detail in just a few minutes, as well as the post-concussive syndrome. Those both relate to the inner ear as well. You can also have dizziness related to neck pain. So it's called cervicogenic dizziness, and it's symptoms that occur after neck pain or neck injury. And the dizziness can last from minutes to hours. And usually it's kind of a movement type of sensation. Things don't feel like they're staying still. It's kind of a rocking, a swaying. Things just don't feel right. Um, and it's worse with head movements. So anytime we get the neck involved, it's going to be a little worse. Good thing with that is as we treat the neck, some of the dizziness can resolve. So that's one of the easier ones to deal with. So inner ear health, and that's my area of expertise, so that's where we're really gonna dive in here. 
So these are all examples of different things that can go wrong with the inner ear vestibular system. Um, acoustic neuromas, BPPV, migraine-associated vertigo, vestibular neuritis, and labyrinthitis. If it sounds like I'm speaking a different language right now, don't worry. We're going to go into these in detail. Uh, we have mal de debarkman syndrome, superior canal dehiscence. That one we're not going to talk about in more detail, and that's just a thinning of the bone in the inner ear. It's fairly rare, but it can cause some dizziness symptoms. Uh, Meniere's disease, autoimmune inner ear-related disease, concussion, uh, that persistent postural perceptual dizziness, enlarged vestibular aqueduct, ototoxicity, paralymphatic fistula, and aging. So again, not an exhaustive list, but you can see when we narrow it down just to the ear, what we're dealing with. So no surprise, when we're looking at dizziness, we're looking at a multi-specialty approach. So first place that you usually go is your primary care doctor. They're going to take a look at your medications, figure out if maybe that is some of the cause of the problem. You may see otolaryngology or ear, nose, and throat from there. Meet someone like me who does all the diagnostic testing for hearing and for balance. Cardiology may be involved. Neurology is often involved. Sometimes we get optometry or ophthalmology as well because we can get some blurring symptoms because of the reflex that um, goes between the inner ears and the eyes. So a lot of times when people feel dizzy, they feel like their vision isn't clear. And then physical therapy for some treatment options. So I want to talk in detail about the vestibular system. So that's the inner ear balance organ. So your inner ear is located kind of deep inside the skull here. Your ear has three parts. It's the outer ear, which you can look at. Your middle ear is behind your eardrum. And then your inner ear is a little organ deep inside the bone. So your inner ear is made up of two different parts. One is your hearing organ. So usually when we talk about inner ear, that's what everybody thinks of. And that's actually this part right here. Kind of looks like that little snail shape. We're going to touch on that today, but we're not going to talk about it a whole lot. The other side that looks kind of like a ball with all the tubes hanging off of it, that's your balance organ. So it's your organ of balance and stability and also spatial orientation. And that organ itself has a couple different parts. So first thing I'm going to talk about is the otolithic organs. So you have two of them. They're called the utricle and the saccule. What they actually do is they tell us where we are in space based on information that it's getting from gravity. Someone asked me about the ear crystals. Was it the ear? OK. How many of you have heard of the ear crystals? Yeah. So these are the ear crystals. So inside of these organs, you have these little pieces right here. And they're called otoconia. They're little pieces of calcium carbonate. And they're stuck inside of this membrane, this kind of gelatinous layer. Think about it like the little pieces stuck inside of the chunky peanut butter, kind of like that. With that, when we move, it tells us about linear acceleration. So you're sitting in the car, somebody is accelerating moving forward, or let's say um, you're in the elevator and you're descending and you get that kind of stomach feeling because you know that you're moving. All of that is those little otoconia reacting to the fact that we're changing something within the, the gravity. So with that, what it does is it kind of shifts and moves on that gelatinous layer. And then we have all of these little sensory cells right here. And they're called hair cells because they stick up like little hairs. They're also in your hearing organs, so you may have heard about these little hair cells before. And what happens is as things move, these little hair cells kind of sway. Their job is to take the, the motion energy, and then it's going to change it into an electrical energy for processing by the brain. So they're very important. So as we do this, those little otoconia are moving, the little hair cells are swaying, and all of the information is getting sent up to our brain. The other part of the organ, and that's the big kind of tubes off to the sides, they're called your semi- you leave that, Yeah. There's some theory about uh, moving your head a certain way, and these mm -hmm. crystals will come back into place. Yep, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So. Hang on to that question for me until we get to the slide. Um, it's called BPPV is that issue, and we're going to talk about that in more detail. Oh. All right. So the other part is the semicircular canals, and this tells us about angular movement. So you have three of them, the anterior, the posterior, and the horizontal, and they tell you where your head is in space. So yaw, pitch, and roll up and down, left and right, side to side. So as we do all of that, this whole organ is filled with fluid. The fluid moves around and gets those little sensory cells excited. 
So in each one of these, at the end here, you can see it in your pictures there, is something called the ampulla. And it's a bigger part of the organ, kind of like a big ball on the end. And inside it has a little divider. It's called the cupula. And it's just kind of this little sticky substance in there. Your little sensory cells sit in there too. So as the fluid moves, your cupula, that sticky substance, it just sways. And it sways all of those little sensory cells with it. What it does is as it deflects and it moves, it tells us where our head is in space. And it again sends all that information up to the brain. So these are very important for us as well. They all work together as a team. So I talked a little bit about the hearing organ. And you can get some different auditory symptoms related to dizziness because they're part of the same organ. They're different sides of the same coin here. So some different things to look out for as far as auditory symptoms and dizziness would be if your hearing suddenly changed, all of a sudden you wake up one day and it's really bad when it wasn't before. Um, if you're getting some tinnitus or tinnitus, people say it both ways, it can be ringing, buzzing, static. Sensitivity to loud sounds or dizziness, where you feel dizziness when there's loud sounds around you. Or if you feel pressure in your ears like they need to pop, we call that aural fullness, kind of like when you're on the airplane. So all of those can relate to some dizziness symptoms as well. So once everything gets through your sensory cells, then it's got to go up to your brain for processing. So your brain is going to process not just the inner ear, but it's also going to process information from the eyes and from the body. It's going to put it all together. Those are the important parts of your balance system. So the input is first sent to the brain stem that's sorting all of the information from these different pieces. And then your cerebellum is starting to add in some learned information. So how many people know how to ride a bike? Do you feel like you could forget to ride a bike? Probably not. Once you learn it, it's there. That's kind of what your cerebellum does, is it deals with all of that repetitive um, motion, repetitive things that you do. So it adds in information from that part of your brain. And then your cerebral cortex comes on in for some more information. So let's say that you like to go to one of the casinos in town, but you know that there's one part that's got a really slippery floor. Um, there's one in particular I'm thinking of at the Red Rock that throws me every time I see it. So when you get to that slippery floor, you automatically know that floor is slippery, I need to be careful. That's the kind of processing that your cerebral cortex is going to add into everything. So you can see a very complex system of all these different pieces coming together. So there are some very common symptoms that come along with having inner ear dysfunction. So now that we've talked about regular function, I want to move on to dysfunction and what to look for. So you can get vertigo, that spinning sensation. Um, usually that'll cause nausea and vomiting because it can kick up your nervous system. You can get imbalance. So if all of a sudden you need to touch the objects around you to feel still. You can feel uncomfortable walking in wide open spaces because you don't have anything to hold on to. You can get some visual disturbances like blurriness or difficulty focusing. Some people will have trouble sitting at a computer or reading for long periods of time. You can get problems with cognitive disturbances. So it's very common to get like a brain fog sensation where things don't feel quite right to you. You're also getting more fatigue. So things that were easy for you before might not so be easy. At the end of the day, you may be really tired. You can get some psychological changes. So onset of anxiety and depression. One thing is usually even if you've never had anxiety before, when you feel dizziness, anxiety comes with it because you don't know what it is. So they kind of come hand in hand together. We can also get some social withdrawal. And sometimes it's people who are off balance or unsteady or getting symptoms in those different environments where they don't want to deal with the fact that people can't tell something is wrong with them. So they choose to stay home instead. We can also get headaches and hearing changes as far as that goes as well. So this is the answer to your question. So thanks for hanging in there with me. We're going to talk about those specific disorders. So the first one is called benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, or BPPV. And what it is is when those little ear crystals, those otoconia we talked about before, they leave that gelatinous substance where they belong, and they fall free, and they slide around in our semicircular canals where they don't belong. So they go into a different spot in the organ, and what happens is, like I said before, those semicircular canals, we want the fluid to move around it. 
Well, now we've got these little pieces that react to gravity too, and they're not meant to be there. So every time you tip your head up or tip your head down, lay down in bed, roll over in bed, those little pieces are gonna be moving. They're gonna move the fluid around and they're gonna give misinformation to your brain. They're gonna tell your brain that you're somewhere in space that you're not. So usually when you have BPPV, what you'll notice is that the dizziness will last for several seconds after some type of head movement and then it will go away. But as soon as you move your head again, it'll come back for a few seconds before it goes away. And once you get this, you're more likely to get it again in the future. So that usually means something is wrong with that membrane that's holding everything. So once you've had it, more likely to get it again. The good thing about this is that we have some maneuvers that we can use to take those little pieces out of your semicircular canals, move them around the canal and put them back where they belong. Once they go back into your otolith organs where they're supposed to be, then your symptoms go away. So you're right, there are some very easy things that you can do. Um, you can look them up online, but if this is something you get, unless you get it very often, uh, for example, I've had it three times already this year. That's really rare that somebody gets it that much. But if you get it very often, we can teach you to do it safely at home. Otherwise, I would let a medical professional do it for you. The reason is, is as these pieces move around, have any of you ever played that game where you're trying to get the little ball in the slot and all you can do is move it around? It's the same idea, but it can fall into one of the other canals, and if it does that, it's a lot harder to get out. Uh, makes you feel dizzy in a different way, so not something that you want to do. That's not a surgery or anything, it's just mm -hmm. a series of exercises that mm -hmm. the doctor would do with you? Exactly. So pretty easy stuff. In very rare cases, there's a surgical option, but they don't do that one very often at all. So normally it's a really fairly quick fix, it may take a couple of maneuvers to get everything back into place. How do they know they get the ball in the right hole? <laughs> Good question. So that reflex I was talking about where your inner ear and your eyes are connected, what will happen when those little pieces are free floating, your eyes actually spin and turn in their sockets. So um, if you ever are tested for dizziness, we actually watch how your eyes are moving. We're looking at the end of the reflex. So by looking at how the eye movement is changing, we know exactly what's happening to those sensors. Any other questions? I, this is a really common one before we move on. Okay. So, so you don't recommend the internet as a way to... I do not recommend the internet as a way of treatment. <laughs> Information, yes. Treatment, not necessarily. So, like I said, it's one of those things where if you get it a lot, then yes, it's worth doing it at home, but it's worth having someone teach you how to do it very safely to make sure that it's not going to get any worse. Did, did, they, do, did they do that at uh, the place you're from? Mm -hmm. Yep, we do. We even have special chairs for it for people who have neck and back mobility issues. Gee, I went there for three months and they never did. Well, you may not have had this problem to do it. It may have been something completely different. Did you? Usually we check you for it, and uh, these symptoms can look like other things also. So usually, did they do a test where they turned your head and laid you backward? No, they didn't. No? Okay. Well, come on back in. I'll turn your head and we'll lay you back. Is this something different than like the inner ear vertigo, where you have like an inner it is, this is a little bit different. So with this, this is just a type of inner ear disorder. We're actually gonna cover some of those infections and things as we go along here as well. Yes, sir? You identify the problems, uh, can you correct those? Mm -hmm. So with this one, it's a pretty easy correction, but as we go through, um, there's some medical interventions that we'll talk about later, some medication, surgical options, um, physical therapy can be good for other types of dizziness. So there are a lot of different ways to remedy the symptoms once we figure out exactly why they're happening. What, what causes that crystal to fall out in the first place? Good question, a lot of things. So one is head trauma. So anytime you take a good knock to the head, they may fall free. If you have any problems with vascular changes, it can disrupt how the inner ear is working. Um, if you have something like an inner ear infection that uh, targets one of those ears, it can weaken things. Some of it's idiopathic, it just happens to some people and they're not sure why. So, hard to say exactly what's happening unless you've had a recent head injury. Um, sometimes happens after surgery, just because of the way you're laid for so long. Other questions? Yeah. Does, uh, like, uh, 
scuba diving or anything, does that affect the crystals or what is, that's just a... So that's a little different. That's something called barotrauma and it's just a lot of pressure introduced into the inner ear system and that can cause some of its own problems. Um, but it wouldn't necessarily knock these little crystals free. Yes? Yeah. I got an experience last night. I had little dinner. Then I had for the first time um, this anti inflammatory, um, what's the name? This yellow anti inflammatory pill. Um, I'm sorry. If I That's okay. Uh, Turmeric. Oh, okay. Time. Then I went. I sat in my bed and I was on the bed to get in bed and all of a sudden I started getting dizzy but I had a little nausea at the same time. Okay. And that probably came from the field, I guess. It could. It could have been a medication interaction. It could be a lot of different things. It could have been bad timing also. If you get any more dizziness symptoms, I would pay attention. Are they happening after you take that pill? Are they happening regardless? And then we can figure out how we help you get rid of them. Um, but it certainly could be a medication interaction, but it could also be something like this BPPV or something else in your ear related to. Other questions here? Okay. So the next one is called an acoustic neuroma, and this one is not very common. Incidence is one in 100,000. And what this is, is it's a very, it's a benign, but a very slow growing tumor that can happen on the nerves of that balance organ. So as it grows, it can depress the nerves and cause some issues. If it gets big enough, it can even cause some facial paralysis and things like that. Um, it can cause hearing loss, dizziness, imbalance, and it's one of those things where that's usually one of the first things they're looking at, of course, when they scan you, right? They're looking for, have you had strokes? Are there tumors? Things like that. So these usually get caught pretty quickly, and there are some surgical options for this if need be, but a lot of times it's just watch and wait. The next one is called Malda debarkment syndrome. How many people have ever ridden a Disneyland ride or a carnival ride? Yeah, you get off and everything feels really funky for a few minutes until you get um, kind of, what do they call it, your sea legs again, right? Well, this is basically that feeling, but it doesn't go away. So it's triggered by continued motion after traveling. A lot of times it's by boat, so people that come off of cruises and have been on for a couple weeks, things like that. And then symptoms are most severe when everything is staying still. So for most other parts of the balance system, you're going to hear me say with head movement, with body movement, it's worse. With this one, standing still or laying still is the worst, so sleeping is always difficult. When these people are moving, they feel better. And Yeah, exactly. They've got to get their sea legs. So these sensations, when they actually diagnose this, have to last for more than a month. So if you can imagine that feeling sticking around for a month, for some people it can last months to years before it subsides, if it does. We don't really know why it sticks around so long for some people and not for others, but it's thought to be related to the brain's inability to adapt to an unfamiliar environment. So something like a cruise if you've never gone before, things like that. So this next one is the inner ear infections. So it's called vestibular neuritis or labyrinthitis. And it's an infection of the inner ear or the nerves that sur supply the inner ear. And it's usually viral, it can be bacterial, but it's not nearly as common. Uh, and what really throws people is that it usually doesn't involve pain. So when you have an inner ear infection, you don't have pain receptors in there. What happens is you feel really dizzy, um, you may feel nauseated, things like that, you may lose your hearing, but those are gonna be the only indications that something is wrong. Uh, with this as well, this inflammation can happen in a couple different places. So if it's a vestibular neuritis, it happens in just the nerves for balance. So the only thing affected is balance. So you may wake up one day and everything, everything is swirling and it's really severe. It may last for hours, may last for days. Usually these people end up in the ER for medication and things like that because it's so severe. If it's labyrinthitis, what happens is you get inflammation throughout that whole organ, um, the nerves for both sides. So you can lose your hearing and it kind of goes down very quickly. For something like this, we've got to get treatment right away because sometimes the hearing can return, but sometimes it's permanent. Over time, the, vis the dizziness will subside, but the hearing loss is more of a permanent thing. Do you have occasional hearing loss with that? With this one, you shouldn't have occasional hearing loss. There's one coming up where you're, you can have good hearing days and bad hearing days. It fluctuates a little bit. 
it may actually be next. It is next. So, yes, sir. This is a viral infection. How do you get rid of it? So it usually just runs its course. A lot of times the doctors will give out steroids and things like that to help things along. But it's one of those things where you just kind of have to wait until it's over. And it's the repercussions after it that are the hard part, not necessarily the virus itself, since it doesn't make you feel uh, pain or sickness, things like that. It's just the sickness related to the dizziness. So the next one is Meniere's disease. And with this one, this is a fairly common one as well. What causes it is something called endolymphatic hydrops. And all that is, is you've got these fluids in your inner ear, right? You have two different kinds, and one of them is called endolymph, and when you have too much of it, it can cause this disorder. So why you get too much of that fluid, they still don't know. They're still doing a lot of research on this part of it. Uh, but with Meniere's disease, what you get is vertigo that comes and goes, can last several minutes to several hours, and also fluctuating hearing that often happens in one ear, where you'll have good hearing days and bad hearing days. And usually along with those uh, fluctuations in hearing, you'll get some ringing and some pressure in that ear as well. Um, those are the main things that we look for. It commonly develops between the ages of 40 and 60, but it really can happen at any age. Is that mm -hmm. the, when you hear the fluid moving in your ears, is that what that is? It's not. So when you hear the fluid moving, that's usually something stuck behind the eardrum. Um, like let's say your ear feels full like it needs to pop and when you move you can kind of hear some sloshing. Yeah. That may be some fluid just stuck behind the eardrum. The nice part about that is that there's a little tube that equalizes the pressure that when it pops open it can drain the fluid. Do you hear that often? Uh, once in a while. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what it often is, but... Okay, fair enough. <laughs> All right. What's the cure for? So with this one, a lot of medical management. So there are different medications, lifestyle changes that can make this much better. Uh, in rare cases, there are surgical options. And we'll talk about some of the surgical options more towards the end. But usually they're trying medications and things like that first to keep these symptoms under control. So we can't stop the disease from being around, but we can kind of stop the symptoms, make them better. So there's also vertigo associated with migraine. So when we think of migraine, we think of headache, but these types of uh, migraines can be present without any pain. So the main um, symptom that you're gonna notice is dizziness or vertigo. So the symptoms are, um, I always put dizziness in quotation marks because it can mean all of those different things. Uh, you're gonna get some motion intolerance, some nausea, vomiting, sensitivity <laughs> to light and sound. And then this is usually medically controlled also with medications um, to try and keep all of this in check. What's motion intolerance? So if you've ever ridden in the back seat of the car and you feel motion sick by the time it's over, that's the motion intolerance. The next one is called ototoxicity. Again, not quite as common. And what this is, is when you have exposure to medications or other environmental chemicals that can affect your inner ear. So they can affect your hearing or your balance organs by killing off those little sensory cells or affecting the nerves. With this, it's usually very strong antibiotics, um, drugs for cancer treatments, and then different hard substances like mercury, things like that, that you might encounter out in the environment. So you're not going to see most of these things. Usually if someone's prescribing a medication like this, it's a life or death matter. So in the end, we always choose life and then we deal with the repercussions later. Mm -hmm. So someone who's had like a lot of chemo or something mm -hmm. may have a lot of dizziness after it's over with. This yes. Part of that. Okay. So the chemotherapy can absolutely do this. It kills off some of that function. Um, so it's not something that happens every time, but for some patients who have had cancer therapy, dizziness does become a symptom. And we're going to talk just slightly about concussions. We're not going to dive in too much because that would be a whole different presentation. It would take me just as long. So uh, any trauma to the brain can cause deficits in central balance functions. So remember, that's all back here towards the brain stem and the cerebellum. And it often causes sensory mismatch. What I mean by that is I told you the central system was going to process all the information from the eyes, the inner ear, and the body. Well, when there are problems going on with how it's processing, everything's not integrating properly. Your brain can't figure out how to read the situations anymore. 
So that's often something we see with the post-concussive syndrome. Um, and we can also have some neck involvement with that too because of trauma. So with this one, it, the big one with this one is just making sure that you're getting treatment right away. So if you're diagnosed with a concussion, you're having these types of symptoms, you wanna make sure that you follow through with it. If anybody has young children around, um, children, grandchildren who are playing contact sports, who are maybe getting a concussion, baseline testing is really important. So baseline testing before they start sports, so that if they get a concussion, we know exactly what the changes are and we can make some differences. So now we're gonna talk about persistent postural perceptual dizziness. Um, that one's always fun for me to say, it's a little bit like a tongue twister. And it's also called visual vertigo or phobic postural vertigo. It has a whole bunch of different names. And what it is, is a persistent sensation of rocking, swaying, unsteadiness. Most people will tell me, I just don't feel right. Things just feel off, they feel wrong. Um, but it, you don't really get any spinning, so no vertigo. And it lasts for three months or more. And symptoms are usually worse when you're standing upright for a long period of time, kind of holding everything very still. Also with head and body motion and exposure to those motion rich environments. So think about if you go to Costco on a Saturday when everybody else in the whole neighborhood is at Costco and they've all got their carts, everybody's moving around all over the place. That's a very motion rich environment that can cause some problems. And the last one that we're going to talk about is dizziness secondary to aging. So 80% of people who are 65 and older have experienced dizziness. So before we were talking about much lower numbers, 80% is a good amount of people. Research has shown that a global decline of the vestibular function happens with aging. So some of those little sensory cells are dying off, neural function isn't working as well. Part of the problem with this is it puts people at an increased risk for falls. So we know as we get older, our balance gets a little more unstable. We may have neuropathy or something going on in the legs where we're not getting good information. We have, may have visual issues. And then the inner ear is also deteriorating a little bit. The problem with falls is that they can be very, very dangerous, especially in our senior populations. So we've all seen the Life Alert commercial where the lady says they've fallen and I can't get up, but that's a really serious situation. So something like that, a fall, can create a lot of more medical issues moving forward. So the BPPV, those ear crystals again, are a common disorder and it's a cause of approximately 50% of the dizziness in the older population. So uh, what we see too, and no research to support this, this is just something I've noticed through my practice, is when we start to hit the eighth and ninth decade of life, what I'll see is that we'll have some of these BPPV issues but the symptoms don't match. So they won't feel dizzy. People come in, they're like, I'm kind of unsteady, things just don't feel right. And then it ends up that they have this issue, but they're not feeling the dizziness associated with it. So in our older seniors, we always wanna double check those things. Okay, so I've pounded it in now for the last 40 minutes or so, um, how many things can be wrong to cause dizziness. So now can we, what can we do about it to make it better? First is medical intervention. So the most common is pharmacological treatments. So medication is most dizziness patients end up with some kind of medication to try and alleviate their symptoms. So it can be anything from anti-inflammatories, migraine medication, um, medications for epilepsy or seizures are often used for dizziness, antidepressants. Um, down at the bottom we have diuretics and corticosteroids. These two here are bolded because those are the ones that most people get. So one is for nausea because of the symptom of nausea and vomiting. And the other is a vestibular suppressant. So meclizine, bodine, valium, scopolamine, um, those motion sickness patches, all of those things fall into that category. And what they do is they depress the central system so that you don't feel the dizziness. Antidepressants, uh, mm -hmm. medications? Mm -hmm. oh. Yep, so antidepressant medications are often used. Some of these other ones listed up here are more for treatment of the actual disorder itself than the symptoms. Does that treat depression or does that treat the symptoms of the... So it can also treat symptoms of dizziness because what it's doing, again, the antidepressants are also gonna depress some central nervous system function there too. So 
not my area, so I'm gonna kind of skirt around it a little bit. I know a lot about it, but since I'm not a pharmacist or a medical doctor, I don't wanna give you any bad information here. Uh, but those two that are bolded are really the ones that most people end up with. Some of these other ones, like the corticosteroids, are used to treat those inner ear infections and things like that. The other option is surgical interventions, and it is definitely not appropriate for most dizzy patients. It's a very small subset of people that will need some kind of surgery. Surgeries, uh, they fall into two categories. One is either to fix the issue, or the second one is to actually destroy the inner ear function even more to get rid of the symptoms. So what I mean by that, someone with Meniere's disease where they're dizzy all the time, they can't function. One thing that they'll do is they'll sever the nerve that goes to the inner ear, so that all of the symptoms will stop. So of course then we get bad balance information. It takes a while for everything to get better, but all of that swirling horrible dizziness is gone. I have a question. Yeah. When you talk about medical intervention, does that include like when people get tubes put in their ears? So tubes in the ears is medical intervention, um, but not for the inner ear. So it's medical in intervention for the, uh, the middle ear space. So when you get tubes, they put it right into the eardrum itself. What it's meant to do is you can get some fluid kind of stuck behind the eardrum. We were talking a little bit about it earlier. And especially in kids, that, um, that tube that runs down into the neck and connects into the throat doesn't pop open as easily. And when it's not popping open, it's not keeping all of the airflow going through. So your middle ear is filled with air and it's supposed to stay that way. But when the little tube in the neck starts to uh, swell shut, what will happen is it can trap air and fluid in there. That's how people get middle ear infections. So little kids will get a ton of infections and after they've had enough of them, they'll put a tube into the actual eardrum itself so that the tube in the neck doesn't have to do as much work. Does that make sense? I like pictures. I don't have pictures of that one, sorry. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about psychological interventions because most people I see that come sit down in my chair, one of their complaints is I feel like I'm going crazy, I feel like all of this is in my head, no one can find anything. And my answer is always, well, it is in your head, but not in the way you think. So, when we're looking at psychological symptoms, we hit a couple of these earlier. We're looking at disorientation and confusion. We're looking at cognitive fatigue, so easy activities, washing the dishes, something that was really easy before may make you very tired at that point. Attention and concentration, so a lot of people who are still working or they're out and about in the community, like all of you doing different things, it's hard to multitask. It becomes impossible to get things done. We can get some sensory mismatch, so hand-eye coordination might be off, you might be more clumsy. Um, and then we'll get some overprocessing of the visual stimuli. So when you're out and about in those um, big open spaces or those busy environments, it's gonna make you feel really off and nervous. We can get some memory issues. Long-term memory is okay. Short-term memory is more of the problem. For example, I told you that I have some of that BPPV as well. When I have mine and it's flaring up, I see like between nine and 15 patients every day. Someone will tell me their name, I'll work with them for a little while, and by the time we're done, I've already forgotten their name because my short-term memory just isn't putting it all together. So things like that can begin to happen. You can have issues with executive functioning, so organization and problem solving, decision making and self-monitoring. All of this is caused by dizziness? Uh-huh, all of this is caused by dizziness. So that's part of the problem too, is when people are feeling this way, they really feel like something else is going on. They're worried that maybe something psychological is happening. It's not, it's just the body trying to get used to the new normal. So with that, there are different psychologists that can help out. Sometimes it's good to talk with people. Um, support groups are a big, uh, big one for that as well. I know you guys have a lot of support groups here for different things, so um, support like that is always important. Your family and friends may not understand what you're going through, so they may not be the best option for someone to support you in this type of environment. And the last one is physical therapy. So we can do what we call canalith repositioning. That's those maneuvers where we put those little crystals back where they belong. Physical therapy does that, audiology does that, physicians do that. So there's a lot of cross training. You may see a lot of different people for something like that. There's also vestibular rehabilitation. And what that is, is it's a physical therapy or an exercise-based program. 
And what it's meant to do is alleviate the symptoms of dizziness, of the vertigo, of imbalance, so that things start to feel better, you get back to normal life. So improvements are made really by retraining the brain to the new normal. When a lot of these different things happen, we can't fix them. There's no way that we can go in and repair all of the dysfunction. So the nice thing about our brain is our brain is very plastic. Now it has a new normal. We just have to get it used to the new normal and how to use those signals appropriately. So each plan is tailored to each individual specific needs. So if somebody comes in with an inner ear infection and somebody comes in with BPPV, it's not going to be the same program. There may be some overlap, but they're going to be different. It also includes a program for completion at home. So the facility I work in, we have physical therapy right there. Um, and I always tell my patients that we hope to never see them again in the best way possible because we want to give them what they need at home to keep up everything and keep it going well. And for physical therapy, there are a couple different types of exercises. One is called habituation. And the reason for this, um, let's say you feel dizzy every time you turn your head to the right. How many people would stop turning their head to the right? <laughs> An amazing number of people do. And what happens is you actually get, um, when you start turning to the right again, it gives you more symptoms because now you've avoided that movement. So habituation is just getting used to the head and body movements that may be causing some of these um, sensations of dizziness. There's something called gaze stabilization. So what that does is it improves the eye control. It improves that reflex between the inner ear and the eye so that um, it's the reason I can look at you and move my head all over the place without my gaze slipping away. So for people who are dizzy, their eyes are going to slip off a little bit. With this type of therapy, we can keep it very strong so that you're not feeling dizziness with head movement. And then the last is balance or training exercises. So improving balance to aid in daily activities. Let's say, for example, that somebody is worried about stepping over a curb because that tends to be a big one. Curbs are always an issue. If you're worried about stepping over a curb because you're worried you might lose your balance, that's something that we can retrain. Um, for things like that, we've worked with people who have all sorts of dysfunctions within the balance system to retrain what we want to do. We have a lot of people that come in and say, I just want to be able to play golf again. So you'll see people running around our facility almost pretending like they're playing golf. They're hitting targets on the floor. All of these different things is to retrain you for the activities that you're missing. And I've hit you with a lot of information. Questions that you have. Go ahead. Um, my brother was diagnosed with ataxia. Mm -hmm. Did you touch on that at all? And is there anything you can do for that? I did not touch on ataxia. Ataxia is not inner ear related. Um, it's related more to body function. But physical therapy would be probably a good option for rehabilitation for something like that. I'm assuming, is he on medication or anything like that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Not really my area. So if I told you about ataxia, I might be wrong, and I don't want to do that. But um, it, is a, it is a dizziness um, mm -hmm. issue. Yep, you can get dizziness with it. We have resources in our library about ataxia, so after you leave, you want to step into our library, we have resources on that. And we also do have physical therapy here in house um, that uh, does work with people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you're back there. <laughs> Go ahead. I have, um, and I don't know where this fits in because I didn't mm -hmm. hear it, but um, just your normal hearing. Okay. So you don't hear a little, and a little bit of pressure goes, and it goes away. Okay. So as long as it's going away quickly, that can be normal. Okay. So still, it's called tinnitus or tinnitus. People say it both ways. But as long as it's something that's coming and going, it's not something we tend to worry about. It's normal to get it for a couple of seconds where your hearing seems to go out. You hear the ringing for a few seconds, it goes away. That's fairly normal. It's when it sticks around. I have been uh, in the ear constantly since okay. I was 42. It's a little bit worse. Sometimes with allergies, yeah. even louder. Yep. Okay, and the other thing is I had heard, and I don't know how true this actually is, 
a lot of B vitamins type of way that ringing in the ear. So the ringing can come be caused by a lot of different things is the problem. So it can be caused by, let's say you have TMJ or other muscle issues here. It can also be caused by auditory deprivation. So you said you have normal hearing? I have normal, this ear just, it just worries me. Like I said, and okay. I'll hear what's wrong with it. Okay. I'm not sure where it's coming from. I have Meniere's as well. Okay. Is your Meniere's on the left side? Yeah, that's probably why then. So we may be having some hearing changes on that left side, even though when we test the hearing, we're only testing the speech range. We don't test above that, but we hear way above that. So you may have some hearing loss in some of those higher pitches, and something like auditory deprivation can start to create that. So that, that ringing sensation is actually more of a, a brain construct, and the brain is filling in the gaps that it's missing. So when was the last time you had your hearing tested? Well, I think that's part of our problem. <laughs> well, uh, I go into these hearing places and they just look at you, oh, and they just say, oh, you have vertigo, oh, you have many years, oh, you have tendinitis. Okay. Yeah, I know I have all that, and I've had it for a long time. Time for a new hearing test. I'm dizzy, that's the other thing. I mean, this is all, like, you get every circle I have. Well, good. I'm glad it's starting to make sense. We've come full circle here. Yeah. Um, if you have questions, I can answer some for you as well. Go ahead, sir. Who does a person see, if they don't live here where you've got your business and stuff, mm -hmm. who are they looking for? I mean, I've been to an audiologist, mm -hmm. you know, just to have my ears tested and all that, but I'm here because of my father who went through his busyness. They did the CAT scan on his head and they said, mm -hmm. oh, you're good, you know, there's nothing up there. But anytime he was, you know, that crystal thing sounds like. Sounds uh, right, so maybe. Who would he go see if he doesn't live here in this area? So if it's something like vertigo, where he's getting that swirling spinning, I would say otolaryngology, ear, nose, and throat would be a good place to start. Um, what? Say it again. So otolaryngology, or ENT, the ear, nose, and throat doctor. So he needs to go back to his primary care, who needs to probably send him over to one of those professionals for a, a better look. Okay. Other questions that I can answer? <laughs> Question. Yeah. What do you in the ear? What do you do with that? If, you, if you've got it, then my understanding is just no cure for it. There is no cure for it, but that doesn't mean that there aren't different things that can be done about it. So it again, it depends on what's causing it. If it's more of a muscle-related issue, some of the physical therapy team can work with that and relieve some of it. If it's more of an auditory issue, if you have some hearing loss, hearing aids are often a good option to give some of the sound back. When we give a lot of sound back, sometimes it'll calm down that ringing response that you're getting. Um, we can do something with sound generators as well to try and kind of block out the noise. So there are a lot of things that can be done to try and make it part of the background, but there, it's very rare that it goes away completely. Well, what if it's occasional? If it's occasional, I wouldn't worry about it too much. It's when it becomes constant that we start to have some concerns. Yep. So if it's just coming and going, lasting for a minute here, a minute there, is it lasting days at a time? Yeah. Okay. I would say it's probably time to get your hearing checked if you haven't had it checked and kind of go through some of that with your audiologist um, with the TMJ and other issues that might be causing it. And how often would you recommend having your hearing checked? So if you're not having any hearing problems, it's always good to get a baseline. We always want a baseline. After that, if you have normal hearing every few years, maybe every five or so, if you're noticing problems or changes, you want to get it tested right away. If you have hearing loss, normally we'll monitor for a couple years to make sure it's not changing, and then we'll wait a few years before we test again. But anytime you're noticing changes, that's when you need your hearing tested. Yes, sir? Yeah, hard of hearing in one ear. Mm -hmm. I've tried a hearing aid for one ear, and it's all you need two. Okay. Well, it depends on what your hearing loss looks like. So if you are only having problems in one ear, then there's no reason that one hearing aid won't work okay for you. Uh, but usually if they're saying you need two, then you're having hearing deficits on both sides, even if one is worse than the other. Does that make sense? No. Okay, ask me again. Because, uh, <laughs> because I had a hearing aid in one ear, mm -hmm. but it doesn't really help. Okay. So they say, oh, you need two. Okay. Well, I have 98% in the left ear and 50% in the right. Yeah. Well, again, it really, without looking at your hearing test, I'm just speculating. 
Um, but I would say, did you get them here in town? Okay. I would go back and just discuss different options and ask them why they're recommending some of these things. And I'm always happy to give you a second opinion or something like that if you're looking for something like that. But without seeing your test, it's hard for me to answer that. They make more money by selling you two. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think that we would never sell you two when you only need one. <laughs> Any other questions that you have? All right, well, thank you. I appreciate everyone being here.